I'll be basically uh, speaking on acute fracture of the scaphoid proximal pole. Manga Parag had asked me acute or chronic, actually. Uh, so in eight minutes, I would like to cover the acute ones. Uh, if you actually look at the literature, there's hardly any much papers actually talking of acute proximal pole. So I thought I would go through that uh, completely. Now, if you look at these three fractures in our body, the humor, the fracture neck of femur, or the Taylor's fracture, the Taylor neck fractures, or the proximal, I mean, the scaphoid fracture per se. And all these are the troublesome ones. And we always know that all these fractures, or rather the uh, areas, re receive the blood supply from distal to proximal. And when there is a fracture along any of these things, the, the proximal portion goes for trouble, which basically means it might go for a vascular necrosis. And the fracture per se will go for non-union. And I, I, I feel that God created these special areas just to develop our surgical skills and get in with more and more types of discussions in these webinars. Now, if you look at the proximal pole fractures itself, uh, most of the papers give about a very low incidence of 6 to 20 percent. Even in the large series of scaphoid fractures, uh, the incidence or the numbers will be always very, very less of proximal pole fractures. Uh, the other problem here is the union times generally goes stretches between three to six months. I mean, I'm talking this about most of uh, early series, which of uh, conservative kind of managements and you know, not the aggressive kind of approach we have now. And a um, lot of them uh, uh, were actually basically X-ray followed up series. So it's nowadays better evaluated with CT to see the earlier unions. The non-union incidence ranges again in literature. If you see the papers from 15 to 50 percent, on average, you can take about 30 percent and tell people, our patients, that average they can go up 30 percent of a non-union kind of incidence. Fracture displacement of fracture translation, combination, cyst, or delayed treatment. Patient seeking uh, a treatment later, smoking, advanced age, and avian per se are risk for uh, are the risk factors for these. Now. Again, went through the literature for actually defining what is proximal pole, and right from uh, you know this standard definition in some of the books where they say less than 30 per three percent of the scaphoid length on a PA radiograph in ulnar deviation, complete ulnar deviation uh, is probably proximal pole. There's one Schoenberg's classification. Uh, I think it was basically used as a French uh, uh, literature. Basically, the, even the uh, the paper is in French actually. And uh, this is probably was used for the non-unions. And they say, and he, rather he says that proximal pole is zone one and zone two. I couldn't make out exactly how they drew this uh, areas or boundaries, uh, even though I read the paper. And there's a group from uh, uh, Joseph Dials, and they go even more further. They say the proximal fifth is, is probably the, the 20 percent is the proximal pole. And that's probably cutting too close there. A uh, lot of us see these uh, proximal poles somewhere here. We moment we see a fracture line somewhere here, we think it's proximal pole, and uh, you know somewhere near this bend here is actually the waist of the scaphoid. Now, uh, very classical young patients usually with the history of fall, hyperextended wrist, radial sided pain. These are the ones which come. Sometimes they come late because not much of swelling, not much of pain. And possibilities of radial sided pain to be kept in mind would be obviously distal radius, scaphoid, scaphalunate, and CMC injuries. And if you look at scaphoid, the way it lies, actually, it's a big bone there, right? And it's it's uh, spanning both the proximal and the distal rows, and it's a big bone. So if we classically just examine anatomical snuff box, we might miss the fractures here and here. And I keep always insisting that always examine the three parts of the scaphoid. And for the proximal pole is basically on the dorsal aspect. Your listus tubercle is like your lighthouse. And you need to follow that moment. You go distal to the listus tubercle. You get the radiocarpal joint, the sulcus, just above finger breadths there. You'll feel a dip here. And, and the prominence there is a scaphalunate uh, uh, kind of a junction here. And uh, or, or including the scaphalunate ligament tenderness could be there. Or if you just go radial to this, you will feel the uh, proximal pole of the scaphoid. So you're, you're from your listus here, somewhere here, you're going there, and then you're feeling this. It's very important to check for these clinical tenderness. And x-rays, again, the full series of x-rays is required, uh, PA, ulnar deviation, lateral, and, you know, obliques also. 
and in a lateral basically you're checking for any amount of carpal instability especially if there is an injury somewhere here uh, with a, a fracture somewhere there is with the scaphalonate kind of injury and you might get a tc kind of deformity you need to be checking on that ct uh, ask for 0.5 to 1 mm we are going at very small place here and we are looking at very tiny displacement so you might have to go to 0.5 to 1 mm cuts in the axis of the scaphoid and then you see all the views you reconstruct that and then probably you might find the fracture line in one of these things so it's very very important and then definitely mri for early diagnosis uh, is always the second line of investigation ct helps you to see the fracture line the combination and helps you to plan your treatment now once the fracture is diagnosed what decides non operative management or who decides when i say who it's is it the patient or you uh, sometimes it's important in especially in this and for surgery what are the determinants and what is the method of the implant and for scaphoid per se uh, stability uh, of the fracture location and patient factors are very very important for you to treat them now if you go through the herberts all proximal pole fractures straight away herbert says that it is unstable fractures the b3 kind of fractures are definitely unstable fractures so that's what it straight away put into it but if you see overall again by kuni stability frac factors more than a millimeter displacement this is this is for most of the uh, waist fractures uh, intra scaphoid angle bone loss communication combination sorry but the again he says proximal pole again everything is unstable they are all very unstable fractures dc alignment perilunate fracture dislocations these are all dc like i mean these are all uh, stability factors proximal pole per se why it is unstable very tiny fragments small fragments right and then there is a tenuous blood supply we all know about the blood supply intraarticular location bathed by the synovial fluid so it has got its own problems the long lever arm stress at the fracture site here and then the secondary carpal instability which can ensue with this so all displaced or undisplaced proximal pole fractures inherently are quite unstable now the role of cast uh, if you see these outcomes here uh, the original uh, earlier kind of series almost uh, the union rates are just about 70% and casting time to go more almost 9 to 20 weeks so i think if somebody wants a cast leave the decision to the patient themselves you should not be taking you should be pushing them probably towards a surgery uh, in this kind of a situation because we know the problems but if patient insists that not having a surgery you will have to leave the decision and tell them that the union rates are just about 70 and compared to a fixation which is more than 90 and then long casting times of about 9 to 20 weeks right both short and long arm long arm cast have been used in these series but generally this is the incidence of non union right from 15 to 50% as i told earlier with an average you can take it as 30% now since the advent of percutaneous technique more aggressive approach towards the fixation but definitely there are no rcts to compare both the methods cast versus fixation probably an option to explore for us in in future studies surgical treatment dorsal approach gives the direct access for uh, the proximal pole with the percutaneous technique you can use an arthroscopic assisted uh, kind of a technique a mini open technique uh, these are the ones implants keep everything ready k wires definitely might help especially with tiny fragments headless screws and suture anchors uh, are required now a headless screw the trailing diameter is very very important so you need to see what is the diameter here and what goes through the fracture site right and what so if you're going from the dorsal side this is this area becomes a trailing diameter and your basic aim is balancing of attaining the secure fixation while minimizing the risk for any heterogeneity combination there so that's very very important you might splinter the tiny fragment there when you're putting in these screws so which means that if we don't have these right uh, kind of size screws and we don't really get these uh, my, mini and micro screws i think it's not yet available here so it becomes very very important to have this again we don't have morphometric studies in indian scaphoid so we don't know this but then the in, the western literature says about 3 uh, you know uh, kind of a uh, the, that is a, the 3 mm kind of a uh, uh, figure which they put so your trailing thread should be less than 2.8 mm for it to go there and fragments less than 20% of scaphoid area will require these mini screws or the micro screws uh, which are available in some some particular uh, sets now dorsal percutaneous approach popularized by slade a screw can be placed in the central axis you can visualize the scaphoid ligament if you're doing a mini open 
But the only problem is wrist needs to be hyperflexed. So what happens is that can displace the fracture to create a kind of humpback kind of a deformity. There's a way to do a percutaneous fixation. Now, if you flex the wrist, hyperflex the wrist like this, uh, what you see, and I, I use a 14 gauge kind of a, a sleeve here, which can use, be used as a, a drill guide here, actually. So when you hyperflex it and see, and the image, you would see the uh, overlap of the distal and the proximal pole, and that is your central, that is your entry point, basically. So that is the entry point. If you can get it accurately, percutaneously, it's good enough. And once you use, got that, then you have to use, you can use this drill sleeve like this, and then the drill uh, guide goes in through this. Uh, in this way. And then uh, you need to come out on the dorsoradial aspect here because uh, you can't extend the wrist uh, with this. So you have to come out here and then withdraw this wire back here to be in flush at this point here. That is the time you can actually, you know, extend the wrist and take the true lateral views for you to check whether your guide, your guide were in the central place or not. And once that is done, you can have an additional, you know, wire as a derotation kind of a thing. And then the screw can go in. Uh, like this from dorsal to uh, from the proximal pole towards the distal pole like this and check your I'm, I'm again oblique and lateral views and that's how it goes now this is a, a series which uh, shows micro screws uh, used for very tiny fragments like this uh, uh, showing that the the trailing diameter is very small and it can hold on to these fragments now, if you don't get that uh, percutaneous technique, uh, you know, that center point for your drill uh, guide to go in, the guide wire to go in, you can make a small mini opening here. There's no problem with that. You can just visualize the proximal pole here and see the scaphalunate ligament also. And then the steps are the same. You use the drill guide like this. You measure, right? And then you put in the screw there and a tiny amount of cartilage defect would be there uh, like would happen in any kind of scaphoid fixation. That is the way open reduction is done, a, a, a very formal open reduction. Uh, you can, if it is displaced slightly, you can reduce it by joystick. This is not proximal pole. I'm just giving an example of a waist like this. So it's displaced and you put in two K wires like this and then, you know, try to get this. So once you put in from into the uh, distal pole and the proximal pole, uh, you need to get this uh, in a, the distal pole comes towards the ulnar side and this goes towards the radial side and then you can align them nicely and then you can go through a percutaneous technique. But this is for the waist. This is not a classical uh, uh, proximal pole. Arthroscopic assisted, um, my teachers have always taught that especially all these uh, these areas which I showed you initially, Taylor's or fraction of femur or scaphoid, if they, do, if they come uh, a little late, as in, you know, they are untreated and they are, by three weeks, it has to be treated like a non-union. Okay, so that is the aggressiveness we need to have. And now we have an option with an arthroscopic thing, even if the patient comes late by about three or four weeks, <clears throat> don't really have to open up them and with an arthroscopic kind of an assistance uh, <clears throat> we can actually these are the mid carpal portals i'm going in there and you can see the uh, that's the capitate here that is a scaphoid you can see the fracture site here and you can debride that fracture site <clears throat> nicely take off all the fibrous tissue here you know and freshen the edges and then you can go in and do a percutaneous kind of uh, fixation. So you can remove that, freshen the edges, get the fresh bleeding, and then you can, you can go into the... So it's a, just an additional skill, an additional technique. I'm not recommending that it has to be done like this, but just an option for us to remember this. <clears throat> very, very tiny proximal pools of scaphalunate injuries. These are, should be not missed. No, very tiny fragment here. And then there is a you know, gap here, scaphalunate injury is definitely there. And probably a fragment excision is worthwhile in this. Uh, probably this is the only indication. Otherwise, we should not be excising this big proximal uh, fragment uh, fractures. Very small fragments like this. And then you can repair this scaphalunate to this directly using a suture anchor. So that's one of the options. So these are different scenarios and different treatment options you have for the proximal fractures. So there is low incidence, luckily. And then they are inherently unstable. That's what we need to remember. Patient decides on conservative approach. We don't really recommend cast application for a proximal pole fracture nowadays. Percutaneous technique causes the least vascular disturbance. Mini open technique is a good alternative. And complications, non-union and avian require a combination of strategies. I mean, that's a huge chapter again. The moment it goes into non-union and avian, 
how to recognize that what is the role of mri in, in today's world there's so many things which we can discuss but uh, i think for an acute uh, proximal poll this is the basic uh, uh, approach uh, which we follow thank you so much mm-hmm.